All right, so our, our last group is a, another panel discussion that will be moderated by one of my partners, Stacy Stevens. I think many of you know Stacy. Um, I'm pleased to not only have her as one of my partners, but introduce her as the moderator of this uh, fine panel. Uh, Stacy uh, is one of the partners at our firm in the personal injury group. She's a compassionate advocate who's dedicated to improving the lives of injured people. One example of how uh, tenacious she can be is um, in 2007, Stacy challenged the Ontario Adoption Information Disclosure Act and forced the government to rewrite that act in order to protect individual uh, privacy rights. So that gives you an example of how tenacious she can be when she wants to be. So uh, I'd like to introduce Stacy Stevens. <clears throat> Thank you, Len. Um, the panel I have with me today, just get to the right page. We're going to be talking about um, advocacy in a little bit of a different way. Um, we're going to cover two different areas. One is continuing with the theme of today, which is advocating on behalf of your clients. And we also are going to be touching on the things that FAIR and the Alliance are doing in order to advocate on behalf of everyone who's in this room with respect to some of the legislative changes that are coming up. Um, to my right, I have Ruth Wilcox. Uh, Ruth has worked in the community service field for 27 years. She is the executive director of the Ontario Brain Injury Association. She's also been the executive director of a long-term residential program for women. And Ruth focuses on education, awareness, and support and building the affiliate network of local brain injury associations and support groups. To her right, we have Katie Muirhead. Katie is a behavior therapist and rehab therapist. She is working currently as the advocacy specialist with the Ontario Brain Injury Association. And Katie assists clients with accessing services, whether it be medical or legal services, identifying funding sources, and at times act as a mediator between service providers and the clients. Beside her, we have David Payne. David Payne is also uh, one of our partners at Thompson Rogers. Uh, David's trial practice includes personal injury law, insurance law, bad faith litigation, breach of contract, medical malpractice, and estate litigation. And in his spare time, David was the director of Save Our City, which was a charitable organization advocating for fair tax assessments, and he is an active hockey player and equestrian. Beside David, we have Nick Gervich. Nick is the co-founder and executive director of Functionability. He's also the founding member and current chair of the Ontario Rehab Alliance. And he's, uh, he's also a member of the Finance Committee of the Board of Directors of the Ontario Society of Occupational Therapists. He was the former chair of the Board of Directors of the Brain Injury Society of Toronto. And he is also involved with the Hospital for Sick Children Leaders Program and assists with various fundraising activities at St. Mike's and Brain Injury Society of Toronto. And last but certainly not least, we have Tammy Kirkwood. And Tammy is a brain injury survivor. She has come a long, long way since her accident five years ago. And now Tammy has taken her experiences and has turned them to legis lobbying, sorry, the provincial government. She volunteers her time with FAIR, the FAIR Association of Victims for Accident Insurance Reform. <coughs> so I'm going to start uh, with Ruth and Katie. We've heard a lot today, Ruth and Katie, about the non-cat limits and how sometimes, in certain cases, especially our more serious injured non-cat clients, that they don't have a lot of funds available to them. Can you explain for us what services um, OBIA can offer in these types of circumstances? Um, sure. OBIA's role is multi-dimensional and it's multi-layered, so I'm just going to give you a really quick overview about what we do. So when, we, when requested, we do advocate on the behalf of survivors prior to di discharge from the hospital which at times may include acting as a mediator between the family and the hospital team. And sometimes we get calls from families who say, we're really struggling with the hospital, hospital team will come in. Or sometimes we have hospitals who call us and say, we're really struggling with the family. Can you come in and mediate? We also assist in finding appropriate placements 
or sometimes helping bridge that gap until an appropriate placement can be found. After one's discharged, we work with facilitating, uh, linking with local outreach services, and also connecting the survivor and their family members with their local brain injury association. We also advocate for funding when there is no insurance or when the insurance is running out. So when we are actually working with a client, some of our advocacy supports includes process support and guidance, educational support, emotional support, and I must note at times, sometimes we get these calls and they're so desperate, but really there's nothing we actually can tangibly do and our hands are tied, but it's still really important that we provide that emotional support and simply be that empathetic listener on the other end of the phone who can lovingly hold that family story and be a support to them. So that also is part of our, our roles uh, as far as support goes. We also assist, assist with income support programs such as ODSP appeals, CPP appeals, except that has changed, uh, WSIB, uh, Criminal Compensation Board, and we also work with facilitating return to work issues. So that's just a really quick snapshot of some of the advocacy and some of the support that, that we do. But I thought it would be uh, great to actually have Katie who is our advocacy specialist, to actually give you a brief case example, so sort of put into life what some of the services that we provide. So I'll just hand it over to Katie now. Thank you, Ruth. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll try to do this relatively quickly. Um, so this case example is an example of a 63-year-old male who has an ABI as a result of a motor vehicle collision. Um, essentially, he went to the hospital, turned around, was discharged, sent home with very little um, documentation of all of his injuries and no documentation of any head injury. The family did not access any legal counsel. They settled with the insurance company on their own um, and they essentially were paid out for damages to the vehicle. And then they thought, everything's great, everything's settled, let's move on, carry on with our life. Six years later, Obaya gets a call from the family. Things have changed. So essentially what has happened in this circumstance is the gentleman's health declined significantly. Um, he had little to no medical support or documentation of his injuries um, over the past six years, loses his job. They're now on the spouse's income, which is essentially a part-time shift work income and she's just learned that she's been diagnosed with cancer and has to receive treatment, so that income is going to be removed as well. There's significant mental health issues, high anxiety, depression. Um, the only services that are engaged at this point with this family is a social work service, which is gearing down with them. They're, they're getting ready to close the file with this particular family. Um, as they say, no financial support, so they were declined CPP disability. They had yet to apply for ODSP, and um, this individual was no longer safe to be left at home on his own. Um, he was self-medicating, very um, high anxiety, and could not be away from his spouse for any extended period of time. Because of all these issues, he was then admitted to the local hospital into their mental health unit um, and that's where we became engaged and got involved. The spouse contacted us and of course our first question typically is do you have a lawyer? Um, we then learned about the history with them dealing with the insurance company on their own and despite all of this we still encouraged them to seek legal counsel if there was something. I'm not a lawyer, I don't have that as a specialization so I refer to those who do. Um, so they went through our referral process, which is typically what I'll do is refer to three to five different law firms, guide them in certain questions that they can ask to the firms to find the right fit for that particular family, making sure they're receiving the right types of support. Um, and then we deal with the impending issue of what are these people to do with no services and essentially a family breakdown. So my role as an advocate, I collaborate with the hospital system, um, worked very closely with the social worker in ensuring that all the medical work that needed to be done, assessments, uh, scans, things of those, that nature, were completed before, before this gentleman was discharged. And also before he was discharged, we essentially called the case conference. I asked the social worker to locate um, and we worked collaboratively on this as well, but um, finding all possible partnerships that we could find within the community, asking them to come around the table, and most importantly, the, the decision makers from within those organizations to come and sit around the table 
So we had an opportunity to express to them what the client's need was and see if there was anything that they could do to engage support. So within this case conference, we had the social work team come in, VON, CCAC, ABI mental health providers, um, the hospital, and of course we included the client and the spouse as well. It's really important to have that perspective. Oftentimes we look just from the provider's perspective, but we need to know what the need is with the family. And we utilize that time to not only educate the service providers about what the case history was and what the need was from the client perspective, but also educate the client and the spouse who's now the caregiver on what's available, what is a brain injury, what are service providers able to give um, to you, and is that going to meet your needs. So from this, we had a number of different meetings over the course of time, and essentially the result from this was we had a gentleman who had nothing, and he's now currently receiving one-on-one um, -on -one VON support on a weekly basis, CCAC is engaged, um, he has access to a day program in his local community three times a week. Um, He's from a rural community, so transportation is always an issue. Um, doesn't drive, as I say, spouse works, shift work. Um, so we had to arrange for transportation. Um, we get a little creative with these. Some of the times ODSP hadn't been engaged yet, so they weren't able to fund it. So we actually resourced the funding from a local church, um, and they were able to provide that. Um, we got a really great comprehensive medical team around this individual, including psychiatry and family doctors. Um, we managed to get the social work team back on involved and they are actually involved in the long-term capacity now and then we secured some ODSP funding for this individual. Um, and so from that, what we decided as a team, as a community team, was to carry forward with monthly meetings. So we host a teleconference every month with all the service providers um, to provide updates, to f troubleshoot ongoing issues because there are still a lot of medical questions. This gentleman's actually quite a complex case. Um, and continue to move forward and see if there's anything further that we can do and ensure that the services continue to remain engaged. Um, so. Essentially, I'm sharing this case example to illustrate a couple points. So one is the work that we do, as Ruth mentioned, as an organization, but really to highlight the importance of working collaboratively within um, the service providers and trying to find creative solutions to problems, really to enhance the lives of the ABI survivors, but also their loved ones and caregivers that, as Karen um, mentioned, are impacted as well. Thank you. Thank you. Um, David, I have a two-part question for you. First, many cases we hear the term capacity. You know, there's questions around whether or not it be a child or whether it be an adult. Did this person have capacity? Can you explain to us what capacity means, as well as perhaps provide some suggestions to the uh, people who are in the audience as to what their obligations are when they suspect that the person they're working with may not have capacity? All right, thanks. That's probably a 45-minute answer, so we'll do the edited version, <laughs> seeing as what the time of day is. This is a pretty sophisticated uh, audience here. We've all heard about capacity before. Now, just remember that uh, it's really broken down into two issues. Does the person have the capacity to manage their property, or does the person have the capacity to manage their personal affairs in terms of health, shelter, clothing? Um, Unfortunately, I have to do read a little bit of law to you, and just bear with me one moment. Uh, let's talk about property for a moment. Uh, a person needs a guardian to manage their property if the person is not able to understand information that is relevant to making a decision in the management of his property or is not able to appreciate the reasonably foreseeable consequences of a decision or lack of a decision. Now, what does that mean? Frankly, from my point of view, I think that means most of the people going up on the buses on the 400 to Rama. Um, but it's easy in the extreme. We know if somebody is in a coma, they obviously need a guardian of property. Um, let, let me give you one example, though, to, to show you how difficult this issue can be. Uh, a client of mine, I settled off her accident benefits for over a million dollars. I was worried about her capacity. I got a certified capacity assessment. That assessment said she did not have capacity. We got the SAB settlement approved by the court and the appointment of a guardian. This woman had a bad brain injury. She tattooed her whole face, uh, every square inch of it. 
So it came time to do the tort settlement. And she said, yes, I'll accept that tort settlement, David. Just one condition, you gotta lose the guardian. And we did. We got another capacity assessment. We took it before the judge, and the judge said that she did, in fact, have the capacity to manage her property. So there's one person who had a guardian appointed by a judge, same person, that guardianship was removed. And, and I think I'd like to just imagine that, well, number one, let's back up for a minute. Um, it's not your obligation to determine if the person does or does not have capacity. That's the obligation of a certified capacity assessor, certified through the public trustee's office for the province of Ontario. You do have obligations, in my opinion, and ones that if you don't honor and look after, you can in fact be held personally liable one day. Uh, and the reason is, is this, that um, what's happening now is, for example, home modifications are becoming so large, we're seeing them now $300,000 for home modifications. You've got a 17-year-old child. Children are automatically deemed incapable of managing their property by virtue of being a minor. So $300,000 of this person's $1 million uh, benefits for med rehab are paid out to modify the parents' homes. And there's no mortgage back, there's no equity, and there's no note. Years later, uh, there's some sort of breakup in the family, and that $300,000 went into somebody else's asset, and I mean, some OT signed off on that. And somebody might knock on your door one day and say, you know, did you have concerns about this person's capacity? Did you raise that? Because you may be held to account for that. Other examples, I think if we amortize uh, $6,000 a month attendant care, uh, say you've got a 20-year-old, uh, uh, that's gone in 14 years. It's gone to zero. So if there's some parent that is uh, caring for the adult uh, ABI survivor, and they do need a guardian and all that money is gone and nobody worried what's gonna to happen to him when he's in his 30s or 40s or 50s, you again could be held to account. So what do you do? If you've got concerns, you document them. You write the doctors, you write the lawyers, you write the families, and you make sure that you've got that clear in your notes. There's one other thing. I learn things sometimes when I do these things. Um, there's uh, actually a section of the Substitute Decisions Act where anyone can uh, request the public trustee do an assessment of capacity. Come and see me if you want the reference of the form. It's section 16.1, there's a form, and basically you're just saying, I've got concern about the capacity, I would like an assessment done, and that would be good protection for you as well. That's enough for now. Thank you, David. Nick, the Alliance has been at the forefront of advocating um, when the issue of legislative changes to the Insurance Act comes up. Can you bring us up to speed on what the Alliance is doing today, what issues you're dealing with? Uh, sure, and um, thank you, Stacey. And as you mentioned, advocacy comes in many different uh, shapes and forms. Um, I represent the Ontario Rehab Alliance. We are an association which um, advocates for healthcare providers that work in Ontario's uh, auto insurance sector. Um, we have a membership of about 100 uh, facilities representing uh, something in the neighborhood of 3,500 professionals who work uh, in the sector. And most of the work that we do sort of falls into two main categories, at least that's kind of simplistically how I look at it. Um, one is uh, making sure that the magnitude uh, of the benefit structure is sufficient and the other one is making sure that access to those benefits remains barrier free. And what's nice about it is that in fact it, in fact, it dovetails very nicely with what's important to our, uh, to our clients and, uh, and patients because um, at the end of the day it benefits them. So um, I'll tell you a little bit about um, some of the um, advocacy activities that are underway right now. Um, the first one that I'll touch uh, briefly on is, um, um, is work around the, uh, the MIG. Uh, I know that not many people here, um, I think in this room, deal with uh, minor injuries, but um, I think you'll be probably curious to know what's going on with it anyway. Um, so our MIG here in Ontario is the lowest one in Canada, and in fact one of the lowest ones uh, if you even count um, the United States. Um, it was supposed to be an interim measure after the 2010 reform and in fact uh, the government did uh, keep its promise and they've appointed uh, through Fisco a gentleman by the name of uh, Dr. Pierre Cote who's uh, in charge of looking at uh, 
a couple of um, specific items for FISCO. Uh, one of them is the sufficiency of that number, that 3,500, maybe that number is too high, too low. Um, and the other one is um, what treatment protocols are going to be um, um, are going to be available for the various injuries uh, that people sustain when they're when they're classified within the mix. So, for example, a WAD one would receive different funding and a different treatment protocol than a WAD two, and you know, etc. So, um, uh, Dr. Cote is uh, right now in the process of um, um, of going through uh, through the science and. Um, uh, preparing his recommendation to FISCO. That is supposed to be published at some point uh, next year, at which time we're going to be able to, um, to get a chance to, uh, to comment through um, a stakeholder consultation. The next item, which uh, Darcy has actually touched on uh, in the morning's discussion, I'm going to spend very little time commenting on, is uh, uh, the catastrophic uh, impairment definition. Uh, this is something that kept us busy for about over two and a half years now, an on-again, off-again battle which came to be known as the cat fight. Um, so, uh, and, and we've published numerous papers um, on it, held press conferences with our friends at OTLA, um, interviews, and, and we're happy to continue doing that so long as this remains an outstanding issue. Um, but, you know, being realistic, I, I, I really have to agree with Darcy. I think that something will happen in the next few months. Um, I think that the government, first of all, the government has promised to do something about it, and it is, in fact, included in the government's budget. Uh, secondly, as far as the insurers are concerned, I think you can see the, 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 the dialogue, um, or rather the monologue, I should say, from the IBC really heating up. Um, uh, in, in regard to this issue, and the, the simple fact is that despite, despite the fact that there's only 600 people who are injured every year and are deemed catastrophic, um, if the new definition can shave even 30 percent, which is, I think, the numbers that are being thrown around uh, of that number, you know, which is 200 people, multiply that by 2 million, um, which is the combination um, in the difference between the med rehab and the attendant care benefit, you're looking at like half a billion dollars uh, for the insurance industry, so it's no mice nuts for them, and, and that's why they're all over this. Um, the, um, the other um, point that I wanted to touch on briefly is uh, the, the non-CAT benefit, and I think that all of you are aware of um, you know, the, the fairly drastic reduction from 100 to 50 and the impact that it had on your, on your, on your clients, um, but, um, but I think those are mostly anecdotal. Um, you know, it's anecdotal evidence. Um, I think so. What we've done at the alliance is we actually went ahead and we try to we, we, we try to get a better idea of what it in fact means. Um, so we've uh, conducted a survey of our membership, and um, I pulled a couple of stats that I wanted to share with you. Um, so the first one is um, that only 17% of non-cat victims now attain their goals, their rehab goals, as opposed to 57% prior to the 2007 reform. And um, the other stat that I wanted to share with you is that only 31% of the victims returned to half of their pre-accident function, as opposed to 56% prior to the, um, to the reform. So, so this is something that, you know, um, this is good evidence. This is something that we're going to be using um, at uh, the three-year review, which is uh, just around the corner. There are three other issues that I'm just going to mention very quickly, and uh, I encourage you to ask me about them during the Q&A period, and I can, uh, I can expand on them. But uh, three other issues that we're dealing with um, uh, that are more process-oriented or, you know, in connection with those barriers to access benefits that I mentioned about. One is um, there is currently a requirement to, um, to file an OCF-18. Um, and get client signature on it prior to provision of any services. This is increasingly becoming a problem in urgent situations. Um, the other item that we're working on, and I'm not going to steal Tammy's thunder here, but it's um, you know introduction of minimum IE standards. And the third one, and it's a little known um, provision that has been included in the spring. 
and that is that insurers are now able to deny your invoices, uh, even though the service has been pre-approved, if your client cannot or cannot recall or cannot, for some reason, confirm attendance uh, at your sessions. Um, so um, there are some strategies which you can employ to protect yourself. And again, if somebody asks me the question, I can comment. Can you just go to the next slide? Yeah. Um, the last item that I'm gonna uh, that I'm gonna focus on, um, and that's something that I think you're gonna be hearing increasingly about uh, in the next um, in the next couple of months, is um, um, is the issue of uh, uh, clinic licensing, and uh, this is something that came out of the uh, 2010 reform when the government was concerned that whatever gains have been made in terms of cost savings. Um, would be uh, foregone if uh, fraud is not addressed. So, um, so there is, in fact, no such equivalent or similar model anywhere in Canada, and there are only two jurisdictions, believe it or not, in the United States, both of them are in Florida, where a similar model exists. Um, there are many professionals in, um, um, you know, in this sector who are regulated, but the facilities that they work for are not regulated. And in fact, very little is known about, um, about these facilities. So um, once the licensing uh, process occurs, every regulated and unregulated provider that works in the sector will be licensed um, under whatever facility they work for. Why license? Well, improve transparency, uh, first and for, for, uh, foremost ensure that uh, high standard of practice integrity is, uh, is delivered and uh, prevent criminal elements from creeping into, um, into, this, uh, into this sector by understanding the underlying ownership of, uh, of the facilities. Uh, colleges, uh, the role of colleges, of course, will not be diminished. The licensing process is just for business practices only. The colleges will, of course, continue um, to, uh, to regulate uh, practice standards. Let me just go to the next page. Yep. The, um, the licensing process itself will have, um, will have a set of uh, business rules that facilities will need to abide by, and to the extent that they don't, there will be a route to sanction these, uh, these facilities, and this whole process is uh, obviously still up in the air. Um, FISCO will be will be the regulator, so it's not very exciting news. Because <laughs> um, they obviously don't regulate enough stuff. Um, but, um, um, but there will be, but once FISCO uh, starts regulating, uh, there will be three types of uh, licenses issued. Uh, one will be called a facility license. It will be a license available to uh, mul uh, multidisciplinary facilities over 200,000 a year uh, within the auto insurance sector. The next one is called a restrictive um, or restricted license, I should say, and it applies to non-regulated uh, services only. So those folks with that type of license can only deliver uh, non-regulated or unregulated. Uh, services and the last one is a general license, and that will only be available to folks um, who, you know, sole practitioners or folks who bill under two hundred thousand uh, dollars a year. Um, can you go to the last uh, slide there. Um, the timeline to roll out is uh, about a year and a half until completion, and um, there likely will be some fees that are associated with obtaining your license and then the annual renewal thereafter and uh, FISCO is promising that it's only going to be to cover their costs. And there will be some participation, that I, I understand, from the insurance industry in, uh, in, the, cost, um, in the cost as well. Okay, thank you, Nick. Um, Tammy, you've done some great work so far with FAIR um, and you recently spoke before the standing committee on some of the issues with respect to the changes. Can you give us an overview of what took place? Recently, uh, <laughs> recently, FAIR made a submission to the Standing Committee asking our regulators to take an interest in how vulnerable victims are treated by the way of independent medical exams, IMEs. The quality of the Ontario's IME is a ma major concern to FAIR and many of our members who are legislated to attend insurer-sponsored IMEs 
to or be fined $500. I'm not really sure where the $500 came from, but that's the tag they put on it. I wanted to cover some of the points that we have made during our presentation to the stand committee that will improve how injuries are assessed and ultimately the outcome for seriously injured victims. Ontario's IME providers are regulated by their overseeing colleges and while that sounds good on paper, the, re the, re the quality of the, of the reality for the victim is that these for hire vendors of medical opinions often produce poor quality or biased reports. The IME reports are used to deci decide whether or not a victim is entire to, entitled to benefits and they are, not, they are far too often bogus reports who only use to delay or deny the benefits of the victims. Because they are being produced by, by the physicians whose income is be, basically from the insurers who pays for that report. The high denial rate of Ontario's insurance industry aggressive defense tactics has led to an extraordinary backlog of arbitration hearings for victims who are unable to access benefits. FAIR has proposed several changes to provide transparency and honest evaluations for those who are injured on our roads. We have sent our suggestions to various colleges of Ontario with no response. We propose that the changes, the colleges be more transparent about complaints about their members so that innocent victims are not put at risk when attending an IME. The reality is that some IME physicians have a long history of complaints about their non-professional manner that is being hidden from the public. Public disclosure of past complaints about IME vendors would alert patients and their lawyers about potential bias or unqualified examinations and assist in weeding out those assessors whose reports have been called, and I quote, inaccurate, failed, misleading, incomplete, deficient, non-correct, flawed, and of little value or no, no purpose. And that was from the court many, many times. Transparency would go a long way to, by cleaning up the system and accident victims would have truthful medical opinions to work with to put them on the road to recovery. Fair and accurate re medical reports shouldn't be too much, to ask for, too much to ask for and neither should adequate oversight of those who write those reports. FAIR has gone further by not just asking for transparency, we believe that there should be a three strikes rule. A rule that three adverse comments about an assessor's reports from a judge or arbitrator means that that assessor is no longer allowed to do reports. Apparently that hasn't been really accepted by a lot. <laughs> we all suggested that the Ontario start to publish the fees paid to IMEs and their clinics to provide treatments and, ass and assessments. The Insurance Corporation of British Columbia publishes their costs annually so that the public can see where their premium dollars are being paid. I think Ontario should do the same thing. We see the colleges moving very slowly toward tra transparency when our Minister of Health recommended that they publish the names of the clinics that didn't pass the inspection earlier this year. Let me give you an example. <coughs> if you are searching for a plastic surgeon, you can search the web, you can search everywhere, and you will get if they are good or bad. If you have to go for an IME, which you know you have to, you can't, just, you can't deny it, there's no way of searching whether that person is qualified or has credentials, or hasn't been spoken bad about. There's no way of checking because of the secrecy, of the secret conscience. The college has to stop doing that. If we're, if we're allowed to search for a new face, why not help us with our brain? Unfortunately, we never heard back from any of the 20 colleges we've, we've spoken to. We've written them. 
We've given them suggestions and we've heard nothing. Accident victims and their situation seems to be the little concern to the colleges of Ontario, despite the fact that thousands, thousands have to do IMEs, at least one, if not many. Fair hopes that our collective voice of the many members that we already have will be able to focus attention on the careless way the victims are treated under the legislation. I want to thank Thompson Rogers for this opportunity to share with you and for your help. And if you're at all interested, you guys can join us in our fight. A corporate membership's 200 bucks a year. That's not bad. <laughs> the regular members, which is usually our survivors and their supporting families and friends, well, that's 15 bucks. I'm pretty sure you guys can deal that. Help us out. Let's be the collective voice. Let's push back to the insurer who's pushing our victims. Thank you. Thank you, Tammy. Does anyone have any questions? We are about five minutes past our allotted time, but if there are a couple of questions, we can field them now, or I'm sure most, if not all, of our panel will be sticking around for the, the cocktails afterwards. I want uh, Hayden to tell us what happened to the 63-year-old man who they referred to lawyers. Did he get any success? No. <laughs> it's the short answer. They're, my understanding is um, they are still having a discussion. They've engaged with the law firm. The challenge was uh, when I engaged with them, the family essentially, their focus is on the individual's health. So I think um, Stacey had put up there some barriers to service. And for a lot of people um, in certain communities, they don't understand the value of accessing a personal injury lawyer. So they're, they're dealing with all of these challenging issues medically and emotionally. And so to get a lawyer for them, they don't see the value to it, so it's not a priority. So eventually, after we sorted out some of these pressing concerns, they did engage a law firm. And my understanding at this point is that there's basically nothing that can be done. I'll keep you posted. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's fair. In fact, the forms, I, guess, I think in September 2010 when they made those changes, uh, the forms actually changed. You'll notice now it says insured or substitute decision maker uh, appointed under the Substitute uh, Decisions Act. So you're right, for property they would have to have a, a guardian appointed. All right, but they can still consent to their treatment. Anybody else? No? Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.